welcome to this edition of Getting to Know Your Indiana Neighbor. And uh, this neighbor is a native of Ligoti, Scott Arthur. Most of you know Scott. Scott recently was named for the second time from the IHSAA, most outstanding official, this time in girls basketball, but also 2019 in boys baseball. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but we're going to get to know Scott just a little bit more. Scott, first of all, thanks for being here. Thanks, Greg. Thanks for having me. Worth again, by the way, the public library. I don't think I give them enough credit, but uh, oftentimes we do it here. And if you've not been in here, it's a, it's a great facility and a lot of great resources for just about anything you want to do. But back to this. So, Scott, tell us a little bit about your family. Let's start about uh, oh, about the time you were born. Who, who were your parents? Uh, my parents are uh, Don and Jackie Arthur. Uh, I was born and raised uh, right there on Church Street, just down the street from the uh, St. John's Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, were married uh, a year, a year and a half, uh, just under a year before I was born, I guess. And uh, they moved into that house on their wedding day, basically. And they've been there ever since. And that's where I grew up. And that's where we still go have a lot of our family oh, functions. Oh, I bet you do. So that's that's where you grew up, the same house that yes. they're in right now. Correct. Okay. So you you didn't know another house till out of high school? No. No. That was okay. the only place that I knew that was there. And I, and I had grandparents up on North Line Street that we visited. And I had another set of grandparents that lived on Main Street for a little while. So. Yeah. But that's great, though, as an adult. And parents, of course, or, or yeah, parents and their grandchildren can come back home to where you grew up. That's always yes. a neat thing. Isn't yeah, it? and it's always neat to kind of uh, like, like, you know, to go back and look at the memories and stuff that mm -hmm. you had there and then pass those down to your kids and mm -hmm. your nieces and nephews as they all come around for family gatherings and stuff yeah. of things that went on in the neighborhood. Yeah. So growing up, though, uh, most of you know Don and Jackie Arthur because they, they follow their kids and grandkids around. You're going to see them in a gymnasium. You're going to see them at the ball field. Uh, fantastic uh, fans of, of Ligoti sports and, of course, their kids and grandkids. But... Uh, uh, they didn't necessarily grow up black and gold, right? Your mom was green and gold, and your dad was black and gold, but of a different sort. Yeah, uh, my dad, he graduated from uh, Washington. Uh, he was a hatchet when he grew up, and uh, my mom graduated from St. John's just down the street from where she, she lives now. So a uh, little bit of a mixture there, and then now they're black and gold, and uh, they've been diehards, like you said, ever since. Uh, as myself and, and my brothers and sisters and stuff went through the system, and now, you know, grandkids and stuff like that, they are just about everything that you yeah, see. Yeah, I mean, they, they've had a pretty good run, haven't they, as yes. far as uh, sports here at Lagodi and uh, kids and, and grandkids. And, and they're always one of the first ones there. Yes, yes, they right. are the first ones there. They are a little <laughs> particular about where they want to sit at. And, uh, Don't blame them. So they want to make sure that they get to where they want to be. But uh, they love the atmosphere. They've, they've loved being in Lagodi mm -hmm. and, and with the sports and stuff that go on here. Uh, you know, they followed both basketball, baseball, softball, mm -hmm. uh, volleyball at different times, you know, with things going on. So, uh, you know, they're they're black and gold now. Yeah, what did they do for a living? Did they? Yeah. Uh, my dad, he worked at Crane. Uh, he worked in the weapons department out at Crane. Uh, my mom, uh, for a lot of years, was a uh, homemaker. Uh, but at one time, they did have the store downtown right across from the square called the Locker Room. Yeah. Uh, we had a lot of the uh, memorabilia and stuff for Ligoti and, and surrounding schools, uh, as well as some other stuff. And, uh, you know, they talk about that every year we get into the tournament and stuff like that and things that come up, you know, the T-shirts, the hats, yeah. the flags, that's whatever what they, they can be. And that's what yeah. they did. And, and that's where us as kids, we kind of grew up there. Uh, I don't know the exact year, but... Mm -hmm. I can remember working in there and, you know, coming out of basketball practice and then going down there to help them out to get some things ready for that week's tournament or whatever the case yeah, may the, be. The locker room. So that's that's where Hometown Flowers is? Yes. Is that right? Correct. And how long did they have that? Uh, I'm going to guess 10, 12 years. Uh, I can remember it, it was there when I was like junior high time frame. And, and then once I got out of high school, it was still there for a handful mm -hmm. more years. So they were they were there probably ten or twelve years. I guess. Yeah, I remember during the '90 run. I know you were '89, right? Yes. But during the '90 run, and I'm sure they did in '89 as well. But uh, all the storefronts, of course, were decorated. But right. But I remember the locker room. I mean, it would be obvious that they would because yes. you know their ties to to sports. Um, well, let's talk about your formative years and, and siblings. You've got how many siblings? I've got a brother, uh, Jason, who lives uh, now just north of Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, up around the Kings Island area, if, okay. if you're familiar with that. Uh, he's in the uh, hotel business over there. He's a, a hotel manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've got a sister, Carrie, who lives in Evansville. 
Uh, she works at Old National Bank in Evansville, and uh, she's married and has got a kid down there. And my brother, he's got uh, three kids of his own over in Ohio. And then uh, my youngest sister, Stacy, uh, she lives just down the road from me now. She still stays in Ligoti. Uh, she works up at Crane with her husband, Michael. Mm -hmm. And then they've got the two boys that people probably see running around down here playing sports as well. Yeah, I mean, that's grandma and grandpa. You know, you got a ways to go yet and a lot of fun over the yes. next 10 years or, or so. That, that's for sure. So who'd you grow up with? You know, when you think about uh, 10, 12 years old, who were some of your buddies? When I was 10 or 12 years old uh, and, and, you know, People probably remember me as like the little bitty kid that was running around the neighborhood that was, I was always playing sports, but, uh, you know, there was times that the Ader boys grew up across the street from me. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was Paul and John and Jim yeah. and all of those guys. Uh, and, you know, the guys in my class, uh, Scott Wallace, PJ Sheeter, uh, Bobby Harder, guys like that, you know, we were out doing some things. And then the guys that were uh, a year or two even above or behind me, sorry. Uh, like your brother, Chris, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I ran around with him at sometimes, you know, we were always looking for pickup games around yeah. the town. Uh, we were at the little league fields doing our thing. Uh, but you know, our, our house, uh, uh, there on church street, uh, you know, that neighborhood's changed quite a bit over the years. Uh, there's been some demolition and stuff like that of some of the older homes that were there, but that was kind of a little bit of a meeting place because there were some pretty big wiffle ball games in our backyard. <laughs> uh, we'd have, 12, 15 kids out in the backyard mm -hmm. playing wiffle ball and, and doing now, stuff. Now, wait a minute. Would, wouldn't your backyard be right next to the railroad track? Yes. Was it over the tracks of home run? Uh, no, we played the other direction, <laughs> the other and so we played back and forth. Okay. And, and, and for those of you that remember, you know, there was the uh, parking lot for the yeah. funeral home. Yeah. And so we utilized that, you yeah. know, to, as part mm -hmm. of to where it would give us some more space and be able to do some things. I, so. I remember one time, Scott, and I would have been in um, sixth grade, I guess, but down across from where... Uh, the St. John's High School was. Yes. There was a baseball field. Yes. And a railroad track right behind it, of course. The track's still there. And uh, so we'd have pickup games during recess. And Jeff Richardson, you know Jeff, mm -hmm. he's a good buddy of mine. Uh, he hit a foul ball one time during a moving train, and it went in the train, one of the boxcars. And we assume it's still gone. Mm -hmm. Farthest ball ever hit in the history <laughs> yes. was hit on that day about 50 years ago. Yes. But uh, you're right. That whole area was a mecca for people to to get together and to be able to, you know, you had the church parking lot. Yeah, you had the to. church parking lot. And then for a long time, you had basketball goals down across yeah. from the old school down yeah. there with that baseball yeah. field and a playground. Yeah. You remember so that? So there was a yeah. lot. Yeah, there was a lot of going on there. Mm -hmm. uh, we spent a lot of time up at the high school where they had the basketball goals that ran mm -hmm. along where the track is now. Yeah. And we play a lot of ball up there and, and mm -hmm. do stuff or play against the high school playing fast pitch. You know, you had yeah. the squares uh, yeah. on the side of it. So, you know, uh, I wasn't always at home, but there was always somebody that back then that was willing to play a pickup game or, mm -hmm. you know, there's always five or six guys out with their gloves and their bats or their yeah. basketballs or something. And there was things going on. So, well, we've mentioned it a few times on here because it's the memory of so many, but I'm guessing that you made a trip or two to the Greenwell hardware store to pick up uh, whether it was a ball or a bat or a glove or something sports related, right? Yes. And uh, there was some of that going on. And then uh, even when I got, uh, while I was in college, my summer job, I worked uh, remodeling and renovating houses really? with the crew. So I was in Greenwells all the time picking up oh. parts. Oh, here in the area like you were. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we were doing stuff, you know, around yeah. the area. So um, you're pretty handy? Uh, not real handy, but I can I try to uh, find my way through things. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Very good. So when you were 10, 12 years old, did you have an aspiration of what you saw yourself as an adult and what you wanted to be? When I was that age, uh, probably like any other kid that played a lot of sports and stuff, is you were going big time. Yep. Uh, you know, it was yep. it was going to be, I'm a Major League Baseball player, mm -hmm. I'm an NBA guy. Like I said, sports was my life back then. Uh, my dad coached me all the way through high, or through uh, Little League, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. And so, like I said, I was always playing sports. So it was always, I was going to do this, I was going to do that in the sports world. Uh, as I got a little bit older, uh, I started to see that, you know, reality starts to set in a little bit uh, you start to realize some of that yeah. when you're out there it's but, not long after that 10 12 year old yes, age right yeah. that you feel like okay yeah i might not make that big i time. may not make it that big but uh, i'm going to enjoy it while i'm yeah. here uh, i looked back then and, and it's kind of funny that it came back around to this but you know coaching was always there uh, sports casting like mm -hmm. you do 
yeah. uh, was there in the back of my mind. Uh, you know, you listen and talk to people about being a general manager of a team or something mm-hmm. like that, or just being involved involved with the club, whether it be marketing or things like that. But you know, you know how life is; it takes you yeah. on some various paths yeah. and things work out differently. Yeah. But and it usually ends up being the right turn. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. So in in high school, uh, I know you played sports. Uh, was it a passion for you even then, or was you were very good academically, or, or was af- academics taking over at that time? Uh, I was still big sports, big into sports in high school. I mean, I was I ran cross country for three years. I played basketball for four years. I played mm-hmm. baseball for four years. Uh, I was really big into that. Uh, academics was there. Uh, I mean, I enjoyed some of the challenges of the <laughs> academic world, but then at the same time, I also was like. I still want to play sports. I still want to do yeah. something with sports. And, mm-hmm. you know, here today, I'm still, you know, involved with sports. But I realized that that wasn't going to pay the electric bill at the end of the yeah. day, you know. Yeah. So you, your job title today at Crane yes. is a mathematician. Correct. Right? I thought about being a mathematician, but Mr. Whitecamp gave me grades that wasn't going to work out. I don't know why he did that. So, uh, so we'll talk about that in a moment. But I'm not sure I've ever heard of anybody being a mathematician, but I'm sure... At Crane, there are a few, yes. right? Okay, I say academics, and we'll get back to sports in a little bit, but am I right in saying that you absolutely aced the math SAT? Yes. Is that right? Yes. 100? 100, 100? Yeah. Okay. Um, the verbal wasn't so good. That, 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 you know, <laughs> hey, listen, you can always work verbally, but, yes. but once you got the math skills, right. that's not going to abandon you. So did you study for it? Did you just know it? I mean... Do you know anybody else who did that? Uh, there's been two or three since then that have come through Ligoti that have done the same type of thing. 100% on their math SAT. Yes. Okay. And uh, I mean, not not to be like, it was one of those things that I, for some reason when I was younger, I was always a really good test taker. Yeah. I could study, yeah. but then when I go in, I, I was able to take that deep breath and relax and sit down and do yeah, it. Yeah, you're one of those. And when I came out of that one, I was, you know, kind of jokingly looked mm-hmm. at one of my buddies and I was like, I don't know how I did on the verbal, but the math seemed really easy. Really? And they're like, really? Yeah. I go, yeah, I think I did pretty well on it, but I don't mm-hmm. know how I did on the other. Well, that's how the scores came out was I, mm-hmm. I did pretty well on it, but not so yeah. uh, hot on the other. So when it came back and, and you got every one of them right on the math, do you remember a- any conversations with your parents about that or, or, or friends or anything at all? You're, you're not one. No. I'm sure you never have been one to go around and brag about that. But that had to get around. It got around. Um, my first uh, call was from the guidance counselor at the time, was Terry Hassler. Yeah. And he called me out of class, and he brought me down. And you know, and in his way, he goes, "I've got something to present to you. I got, I got to show you something," yeah. because he'd gotten the scores back before I had. Okay. And he goes, uh, "You did pretty well on this." Yeah. And he kind of slid it across. And you know, at, at that time when you're in school and stuff. You don't totally understand the impact yeah. of what that has mm-hmm. and the the math side of that getting that kind of score has influenced basically like with my job now and what mm-hmm. i do today but uh, you know he he was impressed by it and then it started to spread through the school yeah. and then it's kind of like all right enough's enough yeah. you know I, i've done it but it's you know one of those things i want to retake yes yeah <laughs> and he asked me if you know he goes you can retake it and try to up your verbal score you know as a joke but uh you know those types of things happen so if you retake it would you have to take both you can take both but they take the higher from both sides oh, and well, that's what gets submitted so for tell me the truth did you use that on your resume going forward yes yeah so how did you word that uh it's just i basically put a score to a uh, perfect 800 on the SAT <laughs> for mathematics and stuff, just to try to influence anything yeah. that was math related yeah. that might help me get the you know a job or something that I was looking for. So in every interview that you ever went into, did they ask you about that? Uh, probably 75% of them mentioned something yeah. about it. You know. But what's amazing is your actual job title is mathematician. Yes, <laughs> and and that I mean you know how it is. A lot of people get to college and you're going down one avenue and yeah. you go to oh, another yeah. and you're back to another yeah. one and it kept just leading me back yeah. that direction. So wow. uh, that's where I ended up. That's pretty good. That's yeah. pretty good. All right, back to high school. So you you graduated in 1989. Yes. Uh, some pretty good years in there as far as basketball, baseball is concerned. Uh, you were a part of that, right? Yes. Uh, I was on the 88 team that went to the Sima State. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got beat by, of course, Damon Bailey in the Sima State up there, Terre Haute. Yeah. Uh, 
incredible experience. I mean, you know, we know what this community is like whenever mm -hmm. everybody gets behind them and things are going. Uh, of course, those days was single class and it was just, you know, mm -hmm. chaos at times, crazy weeks like it is still now. But, you know, you look back at that and, and think what we were able to do as a ball club and, and to get to that point. Uh, 89, uh, we were really good again, uh, kind of stepped on it. Uh, WC upset us in the sectional final that year. Uh, we'd beaten them fairly easily during the, during the season, got beat by two points in the sectional championship. Uh, that one still stings, uh, even 30 plus years later, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and then I was really close with all the guys that played in 90 with Jeff Doyle, Jeff Nante, Brian Grindstaff, Kenny Fry, Chadway. Mm -hmm. Those guys were my guys for those two or three years while we were playing together. So, you know, we had a lot of uh, good experiences there. And uh, so from a basketball side, you know, it was a lot of fun uh, playing for Coach Butcher and everything that goes into that. You know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that I instill today in players that I learned from Coach Butcher that has nothing to do with basketball, but how you handle yourself and what you do mm -hmm. in tough situations. So, you know, some of that stuff still comes back to help there. And then, uh, you know, on the baseball side, uh, your, your counterpart, uh, Coach Wagner, mm -hmm. he was my uh, baseball coach my junior and senior year, and we won the sectional both years uh, in 88 and 89 uh, for those years and then got beat in the regional down okay. at Jasper. So, so you've got two kids, right? Two kids. Shaylin and Dylan? Yes. Right. So you had a combined, what, three or four tournament championships, sectional, well, you went right. to the semi-state. Dylan won the sectional, did he yes. not? Basketball? Yes. Uh, he was, he he wasn't dressed, but he was part of the team okay. in basketball, and he was part of the baseball team. Yeah, yeah. And, and Shaylin, yes. state champion. Yes. She trumped you. Yes. But but all three of you didn't get a lot of playing time. Correct. Right. Correct. But all three of you excelled academically. Is that fair to say? Yes. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. But what what is it about you? And I, I can only speak to you. You can speak to Dylan and Shaylin if you'd like. But you're a part of a team. You're part of a successful team. You're not playing a lot, but obviously you know you're a big part of that team. Right. Let's speak to yourself. Did you have any problems not being a focal part of that team? Not really. On the floor, I mean? Not really. Uh, in 88, uh, I did play a little bit. I was probably the first guard off, off the bench yep. after Kenny Fry, Brian Ackerman. Mm -hmm. Uh, if there were any issues there. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, my senior year, I played quite a bit, got to see that side of it as well. But still knowing, and this is what uh, I try to tell the other guys, yeah. know your role, uh, play your role. Mm -hmm. And as, if everybody does their little part, it's going to make the whole team concept better. And I mean, that's what you see at Lagoda year in and year out, where people accept what their role is, know what they're supposed to do. And that's why we have some of the success we do. Um, I tried to relay my experiences with Dylan and Shaylin uh, as they were going through. And, you know, like any other parent, yes, you want them to play. But you also understand the team concept that they're absorbing as they go through this yeah. is going to help them somewhere down the road. And, and they're seeing the fruits of that labor now with some of the stuff that they're doing. Yeah, well, I mean, Shaylin, as a perfect example, if she said... No, thank you. I'm not getting the spotlight. She wouldn't be a state champion today. Right. You know, and, and, and not that that happens every day, but it does happen a lot to where you miss out on something that you might otherwise have gotten just because you quit. And I'm not saying don't quit basketball or sports or whatever, because everybody's got something going on. It may be that they're just better focused in academics, but, but it's funny how often that happens is <laughs> when, when you do quit, sometimes you miss out on something. But Shaylin did not. And what a ride that was, not only for her, but for her parents and grandparents, right? Yes. I mean, uh, everybody jumped in and had, had a good time with that. Um, you know, and, and we joke around with her because uh, she was on the team. She wasn't getting to play much. But if I remember right, it was a blackout at the state finals uh, the first time they went up, the year that they won it. And our family showed up in gold t-shirts uh, <laughs> had to stand out but we stood out and, and the t-shirts spelled out lady lines through the black crowd with yeah. the gold uh so it worked out t-shirt so it really worked out yeah. uh you know anything to 
give her a little bit and have a little bit of fun. <laughs> but you it. did that on purpose? But we did it on purpose oh, okay. uh, just to uh, have some fun with okay. her and, you know, just to kind of show support, not only for her, but the rest of the girls and the families that were there that, you know, were backing you, you know, and, and that, that was a really good, good experience for did, her. Did you have um, a favorite sport in high school? Probably going through high school, it was basketball to begin with, but I really enjoyed baseball by the time it got done. Mm -hmm. uh, basketball, I, I mean, I still enjoy it because of the things I do, but uh, baseball uh, to me was that uh, X's and O's strategic mind game that is yep. always going on. And, yep. every, and that's what I still love batter, today. Yeah. Yes, every batter, every yeah. play, there's something you know that yeah. you're looking at. Yeah. Um, teachers, who, who impacted you? that you remember from high school or even, even at the lower levels? Uh, teachers uh, down through the lower level. Uh, Greg Johnson was a big influence. Um, you know, people are going to, uh, and, and my sisters and my mom and dad, and everybody's going to roll their eyes because they say, you can't get me to shut up sometimes. But when I was in high school, I didn't say much at all. I was pretty quiet, pretty low key and laid back. Uh, Greg Johnson really pushed me uh, on the like the speech and language courses mm -hmm. and stuff that we had there uh, to get up there and just kind of let it go, you know, and, and talk. And so it's become easier, much easier yeah. for me, you know, from what I was 30 years ago, I was just going to sit in the corner and just let you yeah. do your thing. And uh, now it's not so much that way. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm more open. I'm more outgoing, things like that. I think part of that influence there, uh, Dave Cavanaugh was a big influence. Uh, as a math teacher, of course, we're back to the mathematics yeah. stuff again, but uh, not only there, but he was a big influence with all the fishing and stuff and, and things like that yeah, that I've done sure, as well. Right. Okay. So, you know, we had that tie. Um, thanking of some of the other teachers, Diane John back in junior mm -hmm. high, uh, you know, with some of the stuff we did there with the school newspaper and things like mm -hmm. that. Those were, yeah. you know, formidable in what we're trying to do. Your, your school newspaper name was? Uh, Main Grout. Yeah. Okay. That's what it was when we were in school. All right. right. Okay. Um, Dave Cavanaugh, before we get away from that, did, did you do a lot of officiating with him? Yes. Uh, Dave and I, when I first got into officiating, he had his look at a guy or two that he worked quite a bit with. Uh, but I really hooked up with him on baseball and we started umpiring every night together in baseball. Um, we were probably doing in the course of a two month period, uh, 35, 40 games. And so I would pick him up at the school or he'd okay. swing by the house and we'd take off and we'd go work a game and every mm -hmm. night. Um, and then basketball, I, I hooked up with him a few years into what I was doing with basketball once I kind of got to the varsity level. And then we probably worked together about 20 years. Did he teach you a lot? I mean, not mathematics, he did. Yes. But but every game that you did with him, I assume he was a mentor. Yes. Did he talk to you? Did you guys get together and talk about what you could have done better, what you did well? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and, and that, and, and we still do that today with the guys I work with. But you know, it, it's a shorter conversation because you're working with guys with a lot of experience now. But when I first started in, he's like, mm, maybe you could have handled this a little differently, and he mm -hmm. would explain how. Mm -hmm. And you know, then I could go back and reflect on that, and you know, as as quick as games turn around, you pick up on, oh, now I see what he means because we just hit that situation mm -hmm. again. I handled it differently, and, yeah. and we're doing a lot better. Do you ever look back at the first few games, first few seasons that you did, and, and where you are today, and, and think how much better of an official you are, or have you ever thought of that? I do. Uh, I've, I've thought about, uh, you know, and, and, you know, times have changed a little bit with the way things are, but I look back on it now that, you know, like I said, I was really quiet. I mean, even when I first started working with Dave and that, and it kind of brought me out of that shell a little bit because of the way, uh, you know, you and I joked around about communication earlier and, and how the communication stuff goes now because uh, I'm probably a little bit better of an official now, but I'm a <laughs> lot better of a communicator yeah. Yeah. and able to get my point across yeah. uh, trying to explain things to yeah. some of the guys. You know, I was thinking actually this morning, you know, some of the officials that are really well known are really well known because from a fan's perspective, they get in the way of the game. They, they try to be that person that whatever makes the calls or whatever. So I'm thinking about you, you know, the way that I would describe you is quiet and efficient. And those are the best type of officials. But 
Uh, but you're telling me that now, you know, your parents can't tell you, can't get enough, you know, tell you to shut up every now and then. Exactly. But I wouldn't have seen that. <laughs> yes. But but during a game, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're very cognizant of that, that, that this isn't about me. It's about the kids. And when now when you're mentoring people, because you hear those comments. Right. You know, you see them. You probably mentioned whether it's college or pro, that he's just wanting to be seen. Right. And I'm guessing you take some of those things that you see and talk to the people you mentor about. And that's not the way to go about it, is that right? right. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, Dave and I, a lot of those veterans in front of me that were mentoring me as I was coming through is, you know, uh, we always talked about working a game and leaving. Mm -hmm. And when you go home that night after the game, you look at yourself and like, who officiated and if you can't tell yeah. who officiated, then that guy got in and out, and he did what he's supposed to do that night. That's exactly right. And that's, that's what I, there, there was, there's been a few tournament games that I've gone to this year with Ligoni, and I thought the same thing. When I left, I don't even know who the official was. Right. I don't even know what they looked like. Yes. Which I'm doing the ball game. I know I should. Yes. But, but I'm not calling the <laughs> officials' names. Right. 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 I'm not, coming, I'm not uh, <laughs> focusing on them. So let's back up a little bit. Sure. We got ahead of ourselves a little yeah, bit. Yeah, no but, problem. But right out of high school, you go to USI. Uh, no, I went to Hanover. Oh, that's right. You yeah, that. went to Hanover College uh, with the intent. Um, Coach Butcher had made a contact over there, and my intention was to go over there and try to walk on and, and play some basketball, just to because mm -hmm. I enjoyed the game right. of basketball, like I told you. Right. And got over there, started doing all the stuff, and I mean, it always comes back to Lagodi with me. Uh, it's like this isn't the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Uh, I went to a few games over there after I decided this wasn't for me, watched a few of them, and I still went to a few and was good buddies with some of the guys on the team, but it wasn't the same, you know? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, I'm ready to move on to something else. Uh, then the, later that, my freshman year, I went out for the baseball team, thinking same thing, let's just mm -hmm. kind of see what's out there. Kind of did it and uh, made it to the final cut on that one. Uh, didn't, didn't make the team but walked away and made some really good friends and, and started picking up and playing softball. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that helped me, helped me uh, you know, yeah. take care so, of So your focus out of high school was in academics. It was more sports. Yes. You're going, you're going to go to a school because of sports? Yes. Okay. Yes. And after about two, two and a half years at uh, Hanover, uh, the, the academic thing started to Mm -hmm. uh, take shape a little bit. Yeah. It was kind of molding. You started its way. to think someday yes. I might need this, right? Yes, yeah. because I at that point realized I wasn't going to the NBA or whatever, you know. But <laughs> it took a while. <laughs> yes. No. no, I knew more. I knew well before then, but I, I guess I just didn't want to give in. I was, there was the stubborn yeah. side it's of me. Still, I yeah, fun, right? Yeah, reached, yeah, you're 18, 19, right. 20 years old and doing your thing. And then uh, I sat down with my advisor, and she told me, she goes, I think. Uh, you need to stick with the math field. And this is about where the math thing really mm -hmm. started to take shape. And we started talking actuarial science and things like that. And so uh, we started branching out, looking for schools that offered a program in actuarial science. And then I ended up at the University of Evansville and finished up down there that's right. and got my math degree that's from right. down there. Yeah. And you were telling me in a previous interview that that's, that's where the whole officiating gig started, right? Yes. The uh, University of Evansville, I took a PE class because it was a, a requirement. Uh, I thought uh, officiating, it was called officiating team sports or something like that. And you could go in there and you could get licensed in both basketball and baseball and go through the semester uh, pretty much just going through the rule book. Mm -hmm. uh, they had a veteran official down there that uh, taught the class, and he would walk you through in the interpretations of certain rules and uh, positioning and all this kind of stuff. And uh, I went down there, and I started doing that and got licensed in both those sports. And then uh, looking for a part-time job, and I, I, I'm assuming this is where it's taken us, but you know, while I was in college looking for a part-time job, a little ad back in the newspaper, which we don't have many newspapers nowadays, but came out, they were looking for officials uh, for the Evansville Men's League. So I went and attended a meeting and that's my officiating career started in a lot of little church gyms and and places like that uh, doing or officiating men's leagues games in Evansville. But they were pretty competitive? They were very competitive. You had a lot of former players like yeah. myself that mm -hmm. really... Uh, were still competitive and they wanted it done the right way. Uh, I was, like I said, 20, 21 years old in there with a lot of 
uh, what should I say, experienced men that were mm-hmm. 30, 35 that still had that competitive beef with them. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I, I learned a lot of lessons <laughs> in a short time, you know, working that league and, and I really enjoyed it. But uh, some guys, some other officials that were there kind of pulled me to the side and said, I've got an easier way for you to make more money and have a lot more fun doing it. And then they kind of pulled me over into the school side of things. And I started doing uh, games around the Evansville area, like the junior high and freshman level, and kind of making contacts and stuff there. You went, uh, or you graduated from your University of Evansville with what degree? A uh, mathematics degree, just a general mathematics mm-hmm. degree with the intent to uh, do, get into the actual actuarial science field. Um, one thing led to another, a uh, couple odd jobs, and then I ended up at a... At, Old National Bank in Bloomington is where I started out. And so I was there for about three years. What was your role? Uh, crazy enough, I was an IT guy, uh, okay. but I did some IT work. Uh, they built a couple new branches while I was there. So I was kind of like uh, going through and, and doing some of the uh, subcontracting, scheduling and stuff for them because of our computers and everything. The computer lines had to go through there. I was kind of overall oversaw all that. And then uh, you can probably remember the uh, panic that everybody had around the year 2000 for the oh, Y2K yeah. stuff. Oh yeah, especially in IT. Yes, and yeah. so I became the Y2K coordinator wow. for the bank. Mm-hmm. And so I was making sure that mm-hmm. with our software people and our network people that Things were going to mm-hmm. not crash, yeah. you know, at that time and, and yeah. get through that. So. Oh yeah, I think we 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 all of a certain age at least yes. <laughs> remember that. And I don't know if anything ever. You tell me. Would have things crashed if it wasn't handled properly, or it was just going to be another year? Yeah, I think it was just going to be another year for the most part. I mean, the thing that they were concerned about, and, and some of some people will remember, but you know, it was everything was just a two-digit year on the end mm-hmm. of everything. Yeah. So they were worried about it going back to 1901 instead yeah. of okay. 2001 and, mm-hmm. or 2000 and 1900. Yeah. But, you know, they were worried about that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And once they kind of got those extra spaces put into some of that software mm-hmm. and stuff, then things were running a lot smoother. Okay. So. When and uh, how did you meet your wife, Marcy? Uh, I met her in 95. So this would have been after college. After college. Yeah. Uh, I'd been out for a few years. Uh, she'd graduated from IU. And uh, we were just out one night and we kind of ran into each other and uh, she was with a group of friends. I was with a group of friends. We talked for a little while uh, or not for a little while then, but just very briefly. And then I went back and uh, a day or two later, I asked somebody, you know, yeah, how do you get a hold of that? Who was that I was talking to? How do I get a hold of her? Mm-hmm. Uh, I had some friends reach out, you know, uh, back in those days, we didn't have cell phones and all that stuff. Right. So. It was a little bit of a networking thing to try to get to, you know, to the right thing. And, and I gave her a call and we talked for a little bit and, and started dating. Uh, we still joke today because in 95, uh, I believe it was 95, we were going to go on our first date. And Lagodi was going to be in the sectional championship mm-hmm. down at Washington in the Hatchet mm-hmm. House. And uh, I said, well, you just want to go down to the game. And she goes, no, I don't really want to go to the game with Uh-oh. you tonight. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then they're still together. Yeah, right. Yes, we're still together. But she, she just. Uh, but you went to the game. I no, we did not go to the game. Ooh, uh, we. That's love. Yes, that's love. I guess uh, love at first sight or yeah. whatever they would say. But yeah. we ended up going out to eat and going to a movie. Mm-hmm. And she was nice enough to allow yeah. me to check the radio occasionally. Okay, I was going to say it's not like you have your phone. Right, you know, you can just right. watch it or listen to it. Yeah. So that's okay. how we kind of got together and, and we started mm-hmm. dating. And, and two years later, we got married. So. And she's from where? She uh, is originally from here. Her dad uh, lives north of town, Charles Day, uh, uh, just north of the lake. And then uh, her mom and her stepdad, they live over at Mitchell. And so she graduated from Mitchell High School. Okay. She went to school here okay. until second grade, I believe mm-hmm. she told me, and then graduated okay. from Mitchell. But, but you met her through the Bloomington Connection. You were working at Bloomington. She was at IU? No, I, I, she was back in town because she had some friends here in Lagodi and we just happened to meet okay. at Lagodi one night and just ran into each other. So. Did you always expect that you'd be back here, Crane, uh, certainly Lagodi area, or was that a, a concern of yours? No. no. I, uh, I was probably the one that when I graduated, I was ready to go. I wanted to see what was out there. 
and uh, I was open to just about everything. And, you know, I've thought about this at times, but it's crazy that uh, everything, the decisions I've made have brought me back to here. Uh, but when I left, I really felt like I was going to uh, mm -hmm. get away from here and go somewhere else and, and find something to do, you know, and uh, to be back here is great. But there's times I look back and I think this wasn't the plan when I left at yeah. 18 to, yeah. it, you know, it, to end up back for here. most 18 years. Right, right, right. But by the time you have kids and things like that, it, it begins to be a little yeah. bit more attractive. You do that in the, in the family aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, we're both close to our families. And so it's nice to be within 20, 30 minutes of each other, you know, with everything that we've got to do. Like I said, I've got a brother in Cincinnati that's a little bit farther and stuff like that. But in today's world, you can do it and, and make it work. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, like I said, when I left at 18, I thought, you know, yeah. I'm getting out. I'm going to go somewhere. And, yeah. and uh, So how old were you when uh, Dylan's the oldest, right? Dylan's how old were you when Dylan was born? Uh, I was 20, 28. Okay. 27, right. 28. Yeah. All right. So you weren't a, you weren't a really young father. No. You, you were ready. Right. Right. Okay. And Shaylin, how much later than that? Uh, Shaylin was two and a half years later than Dylan. Mm -hmm. So uh, around 30 okay. or so. I won't ask 30. you about the challenges of raising kids. Um, now, I don't know them well, but <laughs> I know they're, they're two very good kids. But I'm sure they still gave you some challenges, maybe oh, even yeah. with each other. Well, that, and, and I mean, every every individual, like we talk about, yeah. is, is their own person. Yeah. And so you got to figure out what works with them and, and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there, there were the challenges, but they were great kids. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, they, they knew that they could push so far, but they also knew the right from wrong. Yeah, and they were so respectful. That was good. Right. Yes. Right. And what are they doing today? Uh, Dylan uh, graduated just last year from the University of Evansville. Uh, he's a computer engineer, and he has a job at Crane now. Okay. And so he's at Crane. Uh, Shaylin is in her second year at Bellarmine. Uh, she, uh, sure. matter of fact, is studying math. <laughs> and so <laughs> she's pretty good at it. Yeah, she's yeah. pretty good as well. And Didn't ace the SAT though, right? No, no. And that, I'm I, sure it's harder, Shayla, whenever you yes, took it. Yes, and she, she. There are more numbers today than there ever were. Right, and she's got the you know the state championship, and I she tell her I got the, the I got the academic yeah. side. That yeah. is what I tell her. But you know, both great kids. They both mm -hmm. uh, have done really well for themselves, and and I can see good things for them coming in the future. Yeah. So you're sort of an empty nester, right? Yes. Yeah. Not all bad. Not all bad. <laughs> it, it, it was different, and, and, and you know. Marcy and I talk about that, how different it is, yeah. you know, because of, mm -hmm. you know, come home and there's not other people coming in and out of the door all yeah. the time. So. so when did you start at Crane? I started at Crane in 99. Uh, so okay. I've been there about 24 years mm -hmm. uh, this November. So mm -hmm. any different job titles than mathematician or a bunch of them? Uh, it's just the math thing has just kind of carried me through. I've done uh, some logistics work. I've done okay. a little bit of. I, not real solid engineering work, but mm -hmm. the math side kind of flows yeah. into some of that engineering. Uh, but you know, now I'm a task lead over task lead over a project, and so mm -hmm. that's given me some new challenges as well. Yeah. Uh, you know, a couple yeah. years there. Yeah, that, that's different. So, so for those of you who ever said, you know, what's math for? I'm never going to use math. This guy depends on math. But what do you do at Crane as a mathematician? Uh, when I first use it, and I don't use it as much now with my new job title and stuff like that, but mm -hmm. uh, when I first did it, uh, we would do some testing uh, events. Uh, we had, we'd uh, done some shooting out at the small arms range and things like that. And so we have some probability of hits and things like that for mm -hmm. different yeah. weapons statistics. and sites and statistic okay. type yeah. stuff. And so, you know, there was a lot of statistics and probability things that mm -hmm. I did early on. Mm -hmm. uh, it uh, really helped me because some of the things I can be more efficient on the spreadsheet side of things, uh, understanding formulas and working out formulas so that I maybe only have to enter the data a couple of times and it's going to filter through the rest of the sheet yeah. rather than trying to enter it, you know, multiple times and get it to do things. Okay. Uh, I can understand where the formula is going, what it's trying to do. And, and so that helps me. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that can do it just as well as I can, mm -hmm. but that's what I use my math application for the most. Yeah. Well, you're way over my head. So algebra, ever use pi? Do you ever use pi in, in what you do in your profession? I don't recall. Other Why than, do they have yeah, pi? 
you yeah. know, other than having the pie days at Crane when it's <laughs> there you go. March 14th, people bring in pies and that's what you do. But, you know, oh, is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it, it's a career that you're going to stick around in. Yes. Right. Okay. Yes. So you've been here long enough. So let's go back to your officiating now and kind of, kind of, kind of end on that because I'm, I'm interested in, uh, over the years, where do you see officiating has changed the most from your early days to where you are now? Not your performance, but just officiating itself. Um, We're umpiring. Yeah. You know, you do both, obviously. Yeah. The I, I think that it has changed the most uh, with the way people respond to uh, the individuals that are doing that. Okay. Uh, people are a lot bolder now than what they used to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're more direct. When, I mean, when they, mm -hmm. you know, not so much the coaches. The coaches are still respectful and stuff, but there are some instances that uh, I think now I would have to have a lot thicker skin than what I had to have 30 mm -hmm. years ago when I started. So you didn't see that as much? You had it, but it just mm -hmm. seemed to be, you'd have the little checks and balances. They might test you, but it, mm -hmm. they would kind of back off. Yeah. And, and now you see a little more where people, in my opinion, and maybe it's because I'm getting older and, and seeing the world differently. But now people are kind of stepping across that line a little bit in some instances. And, you know, you hear some of the things that go on uh, around other states or communities or whatever. And you're thinking, hey, we're playing sports. We're not mm -hmm. solving the world's yeah. you know, crisis. But, right but, now. but it's my son. I know. But it's my daughter. Yes. And, uh, you know, those, those sort of things. Right. Um, so what would you say to a young person? Let's use Dylan. He's mm -hmm. your son. So, so you love this kid. Right. Dan, I'm thinking about going into officiating. You know, I, I know that they're telling me that they can't get enough officials these days because of the way people treat them. What would you tell him? I would encourage him to do it. I mean, it's, it's been really good for me uh, over the years with all the things that we've done. The one thing I would tell him is, like I just said, you know, you're going to have to go in and just put that shell around you. You're going to hear the things, but don't take them to heart. You know, you've got to understand that you're doing what's right on a game by game, call by call basis. But no matter what you do, only half the crowd is going to be happy with you. Mm -hmm. And the other half is going to give you some sort of grief over what you've just done or what you've just called. You've got to be able to sort through that. And, and like you said, you understand that it's my son or my daughter that these people are yelling for uh, a lot of those people. Once they walk back outside the gym doors, you know, mm -hmm. they want to be your friends again. But for that 45 minutes to an hour that their son or daughter's yeah. on there, they became a different human. Yeah. Being. A different human being. Right. Yes. So, so you've been doing it how long now? Over 30 years, over 30 years right. started. Like I said, when I was in college at UV just mm -hmm. to uh, pay the bills. And same question about baseball umpiring and maybe it's the same answer, but I would think that the game of basketball has, has changed a little bit more than mm -hmm. what the game of baseball has, even though even though it's changing a lot now in yes. regards to the major league. <laughs> right. Would, would that not drive you crazy? You have to be responsible for that pitch clock to call a batter out or the pitcher a ball. I mean, wouldn't that drive you crazy to have that added responsibility? It would. Uh, I think, and you know, we and to maybe take it just a little bit different as you know, they're discussing the shot clock in yeah. high school. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that the shot clock would work in high school because the younger guys, they've got too many other things to worry about mm -hmm. than worrying about a shot clock. Same way with baseball, you know, having that extra responsibility. If you don't have enough game experience to where the other stuff becomes natural, it's like anything else you do in life. Mm -hmm. Once it becomes natural, now I can add that one or two elements that might, might work for you. But in, for the younger guys, the inexperienced guys, it would be just be another whole headache that you'd have to deal with. Yeah. One of the outstanding officials, of course, and, and, and I'm not just saying that. The IHSAA did a couple of times in uh, boys baseball, I think, 2019 and girls basketball in 2023 this past year. Uh, I, I know those are, those are huge honors, and I know you've, you've, you've gotten other honors. But as you think about your career, in, I mean, what's next as far as umpire? You don't umpire anymore, do you? No. No. That's strictly the yeah. baseball I mean, coaching. Yeah. Right. So, how much longer will you have a whistle? Uh, the whistle was supposed to be hung up about two years ago uh, with COVID. Mm -hmm. uh, that kind of set the timeline back just a little bit. Uh, then also I had some knee issues one year and I had to sit out the tournament. 
And so then my goal was to uh, potentially make it back to the state finals because, you know, nothing's guaranteed mm -hmm. uh, based off your rankings and stuff like that. And, and so my goal, I think right now, and, and I say this and, and, you know, I may go home tonight and Marcy be all over me, but it would probably be about three years. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it would give me one more shot to p potentially walk up there and go through Gainbridge one more time and, and experience, uh, something up there that, uh, until you've done it as a player or an official, you're just kind of like, Hey, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. But when you yeah. do it as a player or an official or a coach yeah. or in that case, you want to go back, you'd be like, Oh, that was cool. Yeah. I've got an opportunity to go back. Mm -hmm. Uh, kids that play in high school, they've got that four year window here. I've had a. 30 year window. And so you're trying to get there as many times as you can in 30 plus years, yeah. as opposed to just that four year window. And, and that's all based on uh, your merit, correct? Uh, in regards it's based to on merit. It's based on a coach's vote. They, uh, around mm -hmm. the state, they vote on you mm -hmm. on a scale and it's all averaged in. Uh, there's some other uh, elements to the grading thing. And then it all go, comes, uh, gets compiled at the IHSA and then they have a rating system. And then they take the top officials based off that and allow you to advance through the tournament. So how many state finals in basketball have you officiated? I've done uh, four girls and four boys so far. And how many times were you disappointed that you didn't get that? Uh, early on was quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, it helps once the experience comes along, uh, you know, just like in any other profession, once the experience gets there and you kind of see yourself in certain scenarios and other people see you in those scenarios and you're mm -hmm. successful at them, then you can get the opportunities and and you know that's like with anything in life you know you got to have the opportunity first to show you can be successful mm -hmm. and then you get that next step to try to be successful yeah. again i know everybody wants me to ask you about the euro step and some of these things the carrying <laughs> ball i'm not gonna do that yes uh, <laughs> and i could, probably couldn't answer those any no, better I mean, than anybody know, else pretty subjective I'm right guessing. yes <laughs> but there are times in particular carrying the ball i noticed that it, it's let go it's let go it's let go and then all of a sudden it, it's it's like 10 times a game, yes. you know, and, and maybe there's, because sometimes do the coaches not go to you as an official say, Hey, watch 22. She or he likes to carry that ball. Yes. Is that happen? Yes. They, or, or, or you know, just this past year, they'll come, you know, there, I can recall an incident in the sectional where one coach and I'd had him earlier in the week and his kid was questionable on whether or not he carried mm -hmm. the ball quite a bit. Uh, but when we got to the next game that I had him, the other team had a guy that probably carried it more often. So now he wants it. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, just like in team sports, uh, we look at ourselves out there as a team of three men or three people nowadays, right. because there's a lot of women doing the officiating as well. Uh, but we're three people out there as a team. And our goal is to be consistent from one end to the next, mm -hmm. you know? And so, uh, once people kind of get set in their ways a little bit, I, you know, I can tell them, Hey, uh, I understand what you're asking for and yeah, it does look a little awkward, but you know, a lot of times you're going to get the ones that matter, mm -hmm. you know, the yeah. ones that really make a difference. And you know, the last question I'll ask you is, is why, why would anybody want to officiate or umpire these games? Uh, you know, yeah, you're getting a little money for it, but, right. but never worth, you know, what you're, what you have to go through the hours, the travel, uh, the abuse. But, and I'll mention one person that I was close with and worked with, Tim Lekomsky, you yes. were too. And I remember when Tim was just getting into it. And uh, it got to the point, of course, Tim was a very, very good mm -hmm. official. Right. And, but he worked at it. He, he, he was very, uh, he had a lot of pride in it. And it's almost like a player where, you know, I could see that when he was getting off work, he was going to go to a game, maybe in Evansville or whatever. There was a little rush there. Right. Right. Why is that? That, that you know, I know you're looking for that perfect game, right. but you know that you're going to walk away from there and you're going to hear something. Y you may have, you know, you did 100% in math on the SAT, but what if somebody came to you on the verbal and said, listen, you only got 94%, you know, you right. got 6% wrong. That's what happens with officiating, isn't it? Yeah. So why does people get involved in it? I think people get involved with it. Uh, one for me, like, like we talked about earlier, was uh, I was really big into sports. And so it kept me involved with the okay. sport. I wasn't on the coaching side and, you know, mm -hmm. for anything, uh, I couldn't play any longer at a competitive level, uh, as an official, uh, we talk about it and it's our way of still competing because we're still driving. Mm -hmm. You still have that goal, like you said, to have that yeah. perfect game. And so you're out there and, and you know, you're kind of mm -hmm. like part of it. Uh, 
regular season games, uh, you know, just like when you're playing, there's certain games it's like, oh, okay, you know, we got this game. But there's a lot of regular season games that are a lot of fun. You got a good atmospheres, mm -hmm. you got a good competitive yeah. game, and you don't want to be the person that lets the rest of that down. So mm -hmm. you've got that competitive edge that I want to get everything right so that these guys are playing on a uh, fair field or court that they can compete and the best team's going to come out and win. And so you are still got that competitive part of it. Uh, it's great for the extra exercise I can get and, you know, keep the body mm -hmm. doing what it does. Uh, the little bit of extra money is great, but it's not what right. it should be. Um, and then ultimately, I mean, I've had success because of some of the opportunities that I've been given. Uh, you know, I've been in the right place at the right time. We've talked about that in, in other interviews before where I've been able to officiate or call certain games just because I was in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other side of it is when you get into the tournament, you almost feel like you're back in high school in that tournament. You know, you're competing, you've got the big crowds, you've got the atmospheres and just everything just feeds that adrenaline. If you're an adrenaline junkie of, mm -hmm. hey, this is what we're doing and, and let's go do it. Okay. I lied, I got one more question. No problem. Probably more than that. <laughs> he is a Ligoti Lions head baseball coach. Yeah. Why did you get into that? Uh, this one goes back to Dylan, uh, because of all the officiating and, uh, umpiring and stuff I did when I was, uh, when he was younger, there were some things I missed. Uh, you know, there, I wasn't at every little league game. I wasn't at every basketball game because, uh, I had other responsibilities to be able to kind of go and, and do my thing, I guess. And maybe it was a little selfish in some instances, uh, but the kids, both Dylan and Shaylin and my wife have been great supporters of what I do. Uh, they've allowed me to like strive for some of these goals to be able to go do what I've done. And uh, so at that point, that's when I was finally getting to the point of, all right, I've done enough for myself. Let's kind of go do something else. Uh, I got out of baseball umpiring uh, Dylan's freshman year. Uh, just so that I could be that dad that sits in the stands mm -hmm. and watches everything. I coached him through Little League, and like I said, I wasn't there on every game, but I was coaching him and doing some things, and, and so now it's time for me to kind of just sit back and take some of it in. Uh, the coach here at the time was Luke Woolens, who's now the head coach at Northeast Dubois. Yep. And yep. Uh, I had been home and pretty much shut down my schedule and known that what was going on, and he goes, hey, I heard you're getting out of umpiring. You want to come help me. And so then I got into that. And now the coaching bug is yeah. kind of there. Yeah. That it's kind of like, you know, hey, this is kind of fun. Mm -hmm. I can still compete. I was side by side with Dylan, his four years of high school, standing in the dugout with him, you know, standing by, on the bases with him, whatever the case may be, coaching first or third or whatever was going on. And uh, so I kind of got that coaching bug. And now it's like, what do I do with my spare time if yeah. I don't do this, you know? So, so, so as we do this, you have a game tonight against Vincennes Lincoln. Yes. So when you leave here, w will the adrenaline start? You'll have a couple of hours. So will the, will the adrenaline start the thought process? I know it already has in regards to strategy, but, but in regards to uh, getting that uniform on, does it, does it still stoke you a little bit? It still stokes me to, to be able to throw it on. Uh, you know, I, in fact, I just, uh, you know, we're always trying to figure out uniform combinations, things like that. Mm -hmm. I get into that. I want the kids to look good. I want them to mm -hmm. perform a certain way. Uh, I love the relationship part of not only the, the officiating and umpiring that I did over the years with ADs, coaches and, and stuff. But now I love the relationship part of with the players, you know, get inside their heads a little mm -hmm. bit, see what it is that motivates them. And yeah. so uh, like when I leave here, you know, like you said, that couple of hours of downtime of trying to get things together and then when I get closer and closer to the school mm -hmm. it's like you go into that another mode that you're just kind of working with yeah. kids and you're trying to motivate them to be their best and, and to come out and hopefully have the success that uh, you know they can have if they do things the right way. Yeah. So anything else that you can think of that I didn't ask that you wanted to bring up or popped in your head but, but anything else before we no, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's been a crazy ride even for you to ask me to do this. It's like what I thought 
you know, 25 years ago, I would be sitting here doing something, talking Just about my life, life. Yeah, yeah. Tell, yeah. telling my story, yeah. you know, uh, everybody's got one out there. Right. And as you found out, you know, yeah. when you're talking to people yeah. and, and that's been the crazy uh, thing about all this is, you know, uh, we discussed earlier, 18 years old, where are you going to be, mm-hmm. you know, and you have yeah. these goals and aspirations and all then you look good. back and it's yeah. like 35 years later and you're not doing any of those well, things, but yeah. you had a heck of a ride doing it, you know, when mm-hmm. places yeah. I've got to go see things I've done because of some of these other life decisions, you know, you just encourage people to, you know, take that chance every mm-hmm. once in a while and, and do something like, you know, like, Hey, let's give this a whirl. And it, and it may, you know, work out in the end. Yeah. Well, I'll say this as a coach, you're good, but as an umpire, as an official, you're the best. Oh, I appreciate it, Greg. And I don't know about that. But that's not just me. That's yeah. the IHS AA well, on a number of occasions. Yeah. So thank you so much for doing this. All right. Well. Thanks a lot, Greg. And good luck to the rest of the season. All right. Appreciate it. Head baseball coach Ed Ligotti, Scott Arthur, mathematician at Crane, perfect score on his math SAT, a couple of brilliant children, lovely wife. He's got it all. Let's get him a win tonight. They're playing Vincent's Lincoln. That's Scott Arthur. And thank you for watching this episode of Getting to Know Your Indiana Neighbor. Mm-hmm.